before we go back to the Foucault uh, Prisons book, which I'd like to finish our work on today uh, for the most part, I'd like to ask uh, what kinds of things um, uh, have come up for people in, uh, in thinking about uh, the materials we've been dealing with recently, not necessarily just the last time, but uh, the times before, whether there are statements, uh, objections, questions, uh, uh, or uh, calls for clarification. Uh, some people have given me in between a few questions that I'll take up in their in their place, although it doesn't really replace your uh, your own um, your own uh, uh, questions and discussion. Uh, if anyone has any ideas of how physically in a room like this we can get more discussion going, I'd, I'd be willing to. I'd certainly welcome uh, hearing them. My own method for for uh, provoking discussion has always been to talk so much that uh, people get frustrated and then hopefully interrupt me and begin talking themselves. I'm not sure whether that really works or not. Uh, well, let's try it this way then. Having tried discussion at the end and then the beginning, we might try it this time at the middle, since I'd like to finish this Foucault about halfway through the, um, uh, the two hours today so that we can get on, uh, at least makes a little headway with um, with the dialectic of enlightenment and make a bridge then from the French materials we've been looking at until now to the, um, to the German. Now, uh, one more thing before I begin, which will be an announcement about the, f the readings of the last two, which now the last two rather than three uh, sessions, since one of these will go on into the next uh, semester. Uh, we will, I hope, uh, very largely deal with Derrida's grammatology in, in those sessions. Does anybody have a, a, uh, a copy of the, um, of the English uh, translation with them? I was going to, uh, there, there are really, uh, it's very long. I think uh, its difficulties are rather different from those presented by Adorno and Horkheimer, for example, or Foucault, but, uh, but they're real. Uh, I was going to suggest that you um, uh, may wish to leave out the very center of the book itself, which is the, the lo very long chapter, which is a detailed commentary of Rousseau's uh, essay on language. Uh, and uh, the reason I ask for a copy of the book is I'm not sure what the number of this is, but it's a 150-page chapter in the middle of the second part. But I think the rest of it, I've looked at the book, it seems to me very difficult. I was going to suggest that you only read the first section of the book, but I think there, there are materials in the second part that are really indispensable. So I would suggest that uh, you omit uh, the, the, uh, the, the one long, lengthy uh, commentary on, um, on Rousseau. Uh, there's some other materials that I want eventually to draw in and that I think we have now on our private reserve up in the complete office. One is a, a translation of this very brief fragment of Nietzsche on uh, truth and lies as an, uh, as an extra moral uh, activity. Um, uh, another is, am I right about this, Alex? Uh, the first discourse on positive philosophy of Auguste Comte. That's up there in English now. Uh, and finally, uh, we'll probably have occasion at some point to talk about uh, some of the things that Marx uh, says in the very first chapter of, uh, fragmentary chapter of the German ideology, which is called, which is entitled Feuerbach. So those three texts, the founding text of positivism, because you remember that uh, Derrida's volume is entitled uh, on grammatology as a positive philosophy. Uh, the founding text of positivism, uh, a very representative and extremely influential uh, fragment that can represent the Nietzschean mode of negative hermeneutics or, or, uh, uh, or demystificatory uh, thought, and finally, uh, Marxism. It's in the light of those three things that I'd like to look at what Derrida um, is doing in the grammatology. So those, those will be things that we'll at least try to begin to do by the next two times. As for the Friday sessions, we'll go on with Flaubert tomorrow and perhaps say a word or two about Conrad, then uh, devote the next two Friday sessions to Lord Jim. <laughs>
and I think Nostromo we won't get to till next semester. Okay, now let me um, let me come back to the problem that we raised, the problems that we raised in connection with uh, surveiller punir. Uh, these are some of them Foucault's problems. That is, therefore. Uh, fictive problems, since his book will solve them for himself and for us. And some of them are our problems, which are not maybe quite so easy to solve, um, and we'll get to those later. Uh, I suggested two of those. One has to do with Foucault's thought, the, relation, the, 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 the relationship between this historical paradigm and the one we had in, um, in Words and Things, in, in the Order of Things. That is to say, between uh, a work which, as we'll see today, ends up being a description of the influence of sheer, oh, how can I say it, sheer mindless programmation on uh, the production of all kinds of phenomena and institutions and social practices and so on. Uh, this is essentially what the prison book will, uh, will, uh, will end up uh, giving us a picture of. And the study of, uh, that would seem to be, therefore, almost a, uh, 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 if these aren't contradictory things, a kind of uh, <coughs> behavioristic determinism that is a, 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 an analysis of, of historical patterns in terms of a pure, uh, as I say, mindless, um, non-unmeaningful uh, patterning systems. And on the other hand, in the order of things, uh, the analysis of all these, of, of, of a great many of the same historical cultural phenomena from the other uh, end of the mind-body split, that is in terms of pure mental forms, pure uh, um, uh, conceptual uh, a priori frameworks uh, in which all thinking has to take place and uh, without which, uh, and outside of which, if in any given in any given period, nothing can take place. It would seem, therefore, that just from the, from the, from the outside, uh, Foucault's own work is torn by a kind of, we could call it a dialectic, or we could call it a double bind. It's not clear uh, what it is. That is, by a, a kind of vicious alternative of a choice either between a kind of absolute idealism in which uh, it is the mental forms which ultimately uh, give shape to everything that's going on in a um, uh, in a, uh, in a in a moment of history, uh, and uh, at the other end, a kind of uh, absolute uh, quasi physical determinism. I don't know whether it's a materialism or not, uh, in which uh, even the mind itself uh, and its illusions, its uh, products, objects, and so forth are the result of something very different from the other, which one would have to, which I, which I think of in terms of programmation, and of which we already gave a, an illustration. Do I, did you have that? No. Thank you. Um, since it's sort of hard to make my, my little drawings, at least I want to indulge this particular one, which is. Quadrillage. Uh, this is then uh, the image which Foucault, which will, which seems to guide Foucault increasingly throughout this uh, this work. So that was one. That's one issue which is raised for us about these two books, and which I think I'm not sure uh, that we can solve except by doing the the. Uh, the natural and the obvious and the really inevitable thing, which is to say, well, on the one hand, uh, you have uh, pure, pure form without content, and on the other hand, you have pure uh, programmation without any kind of, um, without any kind of uh, consciousness. Uh, and therefore, uh, the alternation in Foucault's work between these things uh, would certainly suggest the need to lift oneself to a level where both of these things could be seen as parts of some larger process in which this opposition wouldn't, uh, wouldn't hold. Uh, and perhaps we can suggest something like that uh, later on. Uh, the, other, uh, the other question which is, um, which is raised by this book is more uh, substantive. And it has to do precisely with the um, with the, the status of this, this process. Um, 
Now, I want to suggest, I, and this is a, a, a matter more of uh, intuition, I guess, than, uh, than, uh, than it is of, of uh, proof. Uh, I want to suggest that what's described in the prison's book as cadrillage, that is, the, the, the way in which the technological, the uh, political technology of the body, uh, as he describes this um, object of study in another place, the way in which space is rigorously organized, um, uh, in which the old kind of qualitative space is abolished, uh, in which a kind of uh, universal homogeneity, quantification, measurability uh, is imposed uh, and ultimately imposed even on those very peculiar parts of space which are human bodies, uh, such that uh, this universal pattern obtains uh, and such that it can be made to obtain uh, because uh, there's, a kind of, uh, there's a kind of endless cause and effect uh, uh, or kind of endless production uh, uh, of one and the other here, uh, space is um, is submitted to this uh, uh, to this formula uh, uh, to, to this kind of organization in order that it may be broken down and become more susceptible to being further submitted to it, and so on. It's a kind of infinite uh, uh, process, a kind of progressive uh, uh, dialectic of of, uh, of control. Uh, I want to suggest that that <laughs> seems to me to bear, if, we, if you look back at the order of things and the four moments of, of that book, to bear the, 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 uh, the episteme uh, to which that presents the greatest resemblance is not the one which ought to be chronological with it, which ought to be contemporaneous with it, that is to say, the so-called 19th century episteme, the episteme of life, work, uh, and language, but rather the 18th century tableau. This is essentially, it seems to me, a kind of control, a kind of organization of the outside world, uh, which, uh, uh, of which the tableau, the taxonomy, the sorting out of space into, into, uh, into little uh, um, classifications and pockets and so forth, uh, uh, is one of the privileged uh, expressions. Now, if that's the case, then uh, we have, then there has been a change in Foucault's view of the so-called classical episteme. In the order of things, uh, he wanted to, wanted to suggest that uh, it fell apart in the late 18th century and was replaced by something else, or rather that something else came, emerged from its ruins uh, in very much the way that Marx talks about uh, old, newer forms emerging from the, from the ruins and in the interstices of, of older ones. Uh, so, uh, so then, uh, from, the, from the point of view of that book, the tableau and the quadrillage uh, ought to have disappeared. And the 19th century ought to, ought to have invented its own mode of, um, of, of power and of domination. On the other hand, it's clear from, the, from the, these initial descriptions that I read you of the great uh, spectacular tortures and of what one can call um, uh, the, the mode of, uh, this is not now Foucault's term, but Habermas's, the, the way that the Ancien Regime uh, represents uh, and, and organizes its physical displays, that is, the, uh, the, the torturing of the uh, and, and, uh, and uh, execution, a public execution of the criminal as a kind of celebration of the body itself and a kind of reaffirmation of the king's body on, on the body of the criminal. It's very clear that that, if that's what the, if that's the kind of, um, if those are the systems of representation which are proper to the Ancien Regime, to what precedes the coming of the middle class world, then they have very little to do or they have very little in common with this classical episteme that Foucault has been describing, which is not, uh, although he uses the word representation for it, uh, which does not function at all like that. So I would suggest that uh, the model of rupture uh, which is present in the order of things, in which the classical episteme is radically separated from the new historicist one. This model uh, is very discreetly uh, abandoned in Chauvet Punir and replaced by its opposite, by a picture of things uh, in which um, it is precisely this um, 
this uh, classical episteme, this taxonomic, sorting, organizing, uh, uh, ideal of quadrillage, which developing in the 17th and 18th centuries will ultimately find its, uh, find its fulfillment in, um, in things like uh, prisons, as we'll see in a minute. So uh, at that point then, uh, the, the older book, the, the whole picture of the relationship between, um, uh, between the thinking of the 17th and 18th centuries and, uh, and the modern world uh, is, um, uh, is modified. And by the same token, the relationship of what Foucault describes as 19th century thinking, which then will disappear with the end of man and will be in structural, uh, uh, in, this, in the structural epistemy, that also is modified because uh, it's not then clear that that thought has found its fulfillment. Uh, so it's not any longer so clear that, uh, that the vision of history uh, that we found in the order of things can really be, um, uh, be, uh, be perpetuated if we do justice to the findings of this of this new book. All right, now I want to talk a little about uh, this book from a, uh, from a different point of view, which is that of um, uh, that of the very problem of writing I itself and the problem of history writing. I think we raised this issue already uh, the other day in in a, uh, in the following form, uh, namely um, how to write how to write a, a totalizing history. Or uh, if one uh, has a vision of, uh, of, a, uh, of historical process as a totalizing thing, that is as a, precisely as a process which seizes on every level of social life and every level of, uh, uh, of activity and, and uh, uh, um, uh, cultural production and, 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 and thought and all the rest, uh, at that point there is no longer any privileged guiding thread because everything is submitted to this process. So uh, we have lots of levels at that point, but we have no, uh, we really have nothing, no thing, of which we can write a history anymore. Now, uh, how does one do that, and what is this problem? Well, I, I think it would be useful uh, to give this problem a, um, a name, uh, and I think one can do this, and I'm opening now, therefore, a long parenthesis before we come back to Foucault again. Uh, uh, I think one can do this in terms of the whole, um, of the whole concept of, of textuality that's ex so extremely uh, influential today. Uh, and that would have been another reason for uh, using Derrida, the Derrida uh, book, because uh, in the beginning there are a few remarks about Modern Times, one of which is a page-long account of how texts are everywhere. He says you have the, the, the filmic text, the athletic text, the, uh, everything's a text nowadays. And uh, uh, so this, this concept is sort of known a kind of immense, uh, immense fortune. Uh, I think that one has to be um, the, the, the ideological uh, part of the concept of, of, of the extension of the concept of text to that, to, to that degree lies uh, pretty obviously in the, uh, in, in the consequence, uh, in the consequence that, that people sometimes feel they can draw, namely that if everything is a text, then everything is only a text, then, then there is no reference since uh, a text doesn't have a reference anymore, uh, and so on and so forth, and therefore this notion of textuality leads really to a confrontation with, uh, with history itself and with, uh, with all those problems that I don't want to uh, enter into right now. Uh, the, the positive side of the concept of textuality, it seems to me, uh, is that it, oblige, it, it does two things. First of all, uh, it allows us really to know, uh, it's, it's more useful in a way in sciences which don't really deal with text than in sciences with do. That is, in literature, we have a text. We have texts. I mean, they've always been called texts, so that's, it's not a discovery to us to know that, uh, that that's our object of study. But in the social sciences, it seems to me, there's something extremely fruitful in suddenly realizing that what you, uh, that what you thought of as being a kind of thing, that is uh, institutions or society itself or values or something, that these things that in a kind of naive uh, realism one imagines to have some existence in the world are in reality 
texts. But of course, if they're texts, then somebody has to reconstruct those texts so we can talk about them. So suddenly, the social sciences discover that they've left out an important step, which is that of the construction, the previous construction of the text which they are to study. So now, if we want to study power, uh, well, a power isn't a thing. Uh, it's not, uh, it's not, it isn't available to us as an object to study anywhere. It has to be constructed. And it has to be constructed in the form of a text, reconstructed in the form of a text, before we can then begin to analyze the text of power uh, and say something, and say something about it. It seems to me that that's really a very, uh, a very useful kind of, uh, um, uh, incentive uh, that the to to uh, to the whole process of of, uh, of social study that that uh, that the idea the concept of textuality uh, <coughs> has given us now. I think that very pro and then, but it, but of course it raises some very great problems. That is, how do you construct the text of power? Well, we'll watch. We'll see how Foucault does this. This is indeed what he's doing here. He's constructing. He's writing a text. That's not the same thing. Uh, but his text is constructing another text, which is the text of power, and on which uh, his work will be a series of commentaries. And both of these things are going on at once. He's commenting on this text uh, at the same time that he's constructing it, or reconstructing it, if you want to, uh, if you if you want to call it that. Now, it seems to me that this, uh, that at least in my terminology, uh, we all already agreed that these were all private languages anyway, but in my particular private language, uh, the ultimate, the, 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 the framework and the perspective in which this, the, this kind of work is to be seen, the problem that, this ought to, uh, that all of these studies ought to contribute to, uh, and in the light of which they should all be evaluated, is uh, the construction of a very special kind of text, and the, the text which is hardest to, to reconstruct or to, to construct because it seems both the most immediate to each of us and, and the, the emptiest of content, since it's what results from all these other texts of power, of economics, of whatever you like, and that's simply the text of daily life. Uh, we're t we've been told since phenomenology uh, and since um, uh, the work of people like Schutz or uh, Berger and Luckman's uh, social construction of, of uh, reality, we've been told that, first of all, there is this object of study, which uh, people really didn't realize as such before. People thought, well, you would study the city, because that's a real thing. Or you would study uh, the bank or something, or you would study uh, uh, sh grocery stores, or, uh, or you might study communications, or. But daily life, that's not an object. That's uh, something that's so uh, fluid and, and uh, that uh, there's, really nothing to, there's really nothing there. And yet, uh, it's, in, it's to the production, it's in, in towards the production of daily life that all these things converge. Uh, all of these other things somehow uh, are there. Uh, our own starting point is daily life. Uh, and in a way, the end point of, of all of the work uh, that we do on um, uh, on uh, culture and social life, it seems to me, has to at some point go back uh, and end up in this area which is uh, the nature of daily life today and its radical difference from what it was. Uh, and, uh, and indeed, perhaps uh, the, the glimpse of societies in which what we call daily life, secular daily life, daily life organized like that, because that's the way our daily life is organized. It's organized by uh, by the quadrillage of, of time, minutes, uh, space, cities are laid out like that and so forth. And, and so our secular daily life uh, is somehow very much uh, wrapped up in this. And I think we might want to entertain the possibility that there are societies in which what we call daily life didn't exist. The daily life as such, uh, in our sense, is precisely a, a, uh, a product, the product, of desacralization of the end of, of sacred societies, of the end of power society, of the, uh, of the emergence of market society uh, and secular society and quantified uh, society. At any rate, I want to suggest, therefore, that, uh, uh, of course, the text of daily life, in a way, the 19th century novelist wrote that without, without knowing what that was or without having an idea of it. And, of course, it's characteristic that uh, it should become, get a name, 
ähm, äh, äh, Lebensfeld. It should be named the minute it disappears as, uh, as a possibility of, uh, of writing. Uh, and, it, and at the minute when it becomes a problem, that is, the minute, when we begin to talk about daily life, uh, that already means that it's somehow inaccessible to our instruments and that we, we really find it very difficult to, uh, uh, to give the kinds of accounts uh, of, of daily life that the 19th century novelist perhaps did absolutely uh, without, uh, unselfconsciously. Uh, at any rate, uh, it seems to me that um, it's this aesthetic problem, uh, the problem of writing down something uh, which has no form as such, of narrating something uh, which doesn't come in story form, which isn't a thing, uh, which isn't even, uh, you could say it's an experience, but then you psychologize it, uh, and then we have, uh, and then we're back in some form of either psychological testing or or a sociology of, of, uh, of mentalities or something, and I don't mean the French school, but I mean uh, uh, of, uh, of the, the psychology of social groups. Uh, and, and so we're, we're not really in daily life anymore. We're in one of its byproducts, which is the individual subject, which is private life versus public life, which is psychology versus the marketplace or something. Uh, and, we have an, and we've slipped out of the, the center of this problem. So I want to suggest that this is perhaps uh, a, a kind of ultimate framework uh, in which we can uh, evaluate the, the, um, the formal solution uh, which uh, someone like Foucault finds in a, book, uh, in a book like this. That is, this may help us to test this way of writing a history which is not a history and which is not of anything, of embodying, incarnating uh, something of that kind which has no body and which is not a material and of which one cannot uh, uh, describe the trace or the tra trajectory or something. It's uh, in looking at that kind of solution, uh, this kind of new history which, uh, which replaces uh, the, uh, the, the old chronicle histories. Those had, those had characters and people and events and so on, but this doesn't anymore, coming into being a prison. Uh, the coming into being of quadrillage, because it's more basic even than this. Uh, it seems to me that watching how Foucault solves this may give us some hints then about, uh, precisely about, uh, towards a solution of the larger problem of, um, uh, of, um, of constructing the text uh, of daily life of our daily life, of modern daily life. Now, the way this is done, uh, we said the other day that Foucault, uh, I think I brought you up to the point uh, where uh, Foucault lays out the problem for us. He says we have, uh, we have something that looks very simple, a kind of historical sequence, and this is the classical liberal uh, bourgeois view of uh, middle class history. The coming of the middle classes meant um, uh, meant a, a new kind of liberalism, uh, a new kind of humaneness in the treatment of, and of course then we go out of this book and talk about other books of Foucault, of the insane, uh, new, a new kind of medical system, new kind of prison system, and, and all this. We have the whole work of the prison reformers in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. It would seem very clear that what we have uh, is a simple uh, supersession of periods. We have one, the one period dominated by by the, 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 the body as a sacred object uh, and uh, in which a kind of space which is organized around the monarch as a center of, uh, of sacred space uh, and in which uh, the body, the, the, the inscription, and they're very interesting essays of Jean Baudrillard on uh, tattooing and, and torture also as modes of, uh, modes of inscription and of course that comes that you could sort of combine uh, anthro uh, Levi-Strossian description of tattoos with uh, Kafka's penal colony, you get something of the sense of this, uh, this kind of big picture. Well, that's, that's, the, that's, that's the mode of expression, if you like, of this, uh, of this first moment. Uh, this disappears uh, with the French Revolution and is replaced then by a more humane uh, system uh, treatment of, um, of uh, prisoners and, uh, uh, and, and so forth. Well, Foucault says it doesn't happen exactly like that. What happens is that all of the, all of the complex and interesting solutions which the, um, which the reformers thought of, 
uh, and which were very different from, um, uh, which were different but sort of on the same level, uh, on all fours, as people like to say now, on all fours with the, with the, with the, with the uh, punishments of the Ancien Régime uh, in this sense, and I think I read you this long passage, uh, which I won't read again, but in the sense that uh, where there uh, you have the reply uh, to one of, one, the, the crime uh, is understood uh, in the Ancien Régime as being a violence done ultimately to the king's body, uh, and therefore it must be uh, paid back by uh, a violence of equal, uh, uh, an equally manifest uh, degree on the criminal's body. This is replaced by a very different kind of way of thinking about, um, about uh, punishment, in which um, all kinds of complicated schemes are worked out whereby each punishment can suit the crime. The punishment will not only be a way of re-educating the criminal uh, and also of forestalling future crime, but it will also be, uh, it will be a kind of educational lesson. And the punishments will be turned into, um, into signs. Um, uh, and some of, these, some of the examples here, let's see if I can find these. Um, uh, these uh, seem maybe imperceptible to us, but um, each of these, um, uh, each of the degrees of uh, punishment will, in some ingenious way or another, be made to correspond to the very nature of the crime. So you have a whole, uh, whole kind of qualitative uh, um, uh, variety of crimes. And to these uh, answer a whole qualitative variety of punishments. So uh, um, uh, such that each of the punishments is a kind of um, object lesson and is a kind of example. And you could read from the punishment the very nature of the crime. Uh, this to the point where, um, yes, it's, uh, I'm not sure who this is, but where uh, some of the ref more delirious reformers uh, wanted to um, imagine a prison which would be a veritable garden of laws. That is where, just as in the taxonomic system of a zoo, you see each of the creatures and each of the variety of life forms and so on, in this prison you can contemplate each of the varieties of punishment and each of the varieties of crimes. I would like, uh, let's see, uh, yeah, it's a kind of, uh, the, the, uh, the place of punishment should be something like a garden of laws which families would visit on Sundays. Uh, I would like from time to time, having prepared uh, the mind by a reasoned discourse on the conservation of social order, um, on the usefulness of punishments, I would, I would like uh, us to take young people uh, and even uh, adults to the mines uh, and to forced work in order to contemplate the, the uh, hideous fate of uh, these uh, convicts. These pilgrimages would be more useful than those which the Turks make to Mecca, because these are now conceived in a ped pedagogical rather than a representational sense. What dominated the old uh, Ancien Régime punishments was representation, not again in the sense of uh, the classical epistemy in, in uh, the order of things, but, uh, but in this sense of spectacle and a body. Now we have, on the contrary, pedagogy, example, sign, uh, and a kind of uh, um, a re a reply of uh, kind of echo of, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the crime and the punishment. Well, this is all very nice, except that what happens in the 19th century is that it all disappears. Uh, all of this, uh, this qualitative variety of possible punishments uh, vanishes or proves unrealizable, uh, and all that's done is to lock people up. That is to say, uh, this qualitative variety, which was to correspond to the qualitative variety of the various uh, types of offenses, uh, is now uh, absolutely quantified, and we just have the plus, the more or less of, of various kinds of uh, sentences and various kinds of imprisonments. So Foucault uh, pointed out, and this is where we ended last time, Foucault pointed out that we really have not two moments, but three. We have the state of affairs of the Ancien Régime, representation, torture, public torture. We have 
the um, projects of the reformers. And these are at one with the whole claims to legitimation of middle class society, which is coming into being in this period. And then we have what actually happened. The third thing, simple imprisonment, which is not so simple, but in other words, not at all uh, uh, quite different from, uh, from the way, um, the, way the, uh, the reformers uh, imagined it uh, to be, imagined that it ought to be. Now, in another system, one might, might be easy to, to, to simply uh, deal with this problem by eliminating it. That is, you could say, well, it's simple. The reformers are the ideologues. Naturally, they, they invent a uh, kind of legitimation of all this process. What's actually done uh, is a little more, uh, a little less interesting than that and a little more sordid. Uh, and uh, and this, this uh, separation is not at, all, um, uh, not at all so surprising as it may seem. And really, there's no problem. Naturally, whatever whatever the new forms of, of control were, somebody would be found to work up a theory of them and, and tell us why these were far better and more humane and, and so forth than, uh, than the older ones. Well, I think that's probably not wrong. Uh, the point is, uh, Foucault, of course, doesn't, wanna, doesn't want to think that at all uh, uh, for lots of reasons, beginning, I think, with the kind of perversity that makes him an interesting writer because uh, if it's been said too much, he really, feels that he has to show you that it's wrong or that the opposite is true or that something that's, that is neither that nor its opposite is true. Uh, uh, and then I think for more ideological reasons. But at any rate, uh, his, his reluctance to adopt that simple um, demystification of the work of the reformers nonetheless uh, uh, is, has been useful to us because it's going to uh, give us a, a very interesting detour and provide us with a very interesting uh, kind of solution that we wouldn't have had otherwise. This solution is that Foucault will drop the matter of prisons entirely. He'll set up the problem. And then he'll say, all right, now clearly, if this is going on in prisons, it's part of something larger. Where did it come from? All right, so we stop and we start again. And we return to prisons only in the last chapter two of the book um, in a kind of concluding way. And then, indeed, and this is sort of what I like, almost what I like the best in this book, the final sentence has a little footnote, which says, I here break off this book, which uh, is to serve as, as a uh, historical background on various studies on the power of normalization and the formation of knowledge in modern societies. Uh, so that's a, that's a nice non-ending, which corresponds also to the non-beginnings of, of what we're going to see. Uh, well, we suggested that one of the things, so we're going to, we, we want to displace the, the quest from prisons to, some, to, to, to another deeper, wider place, it's not clear. Uh, we want to find the source of, uh, of 19th century imprisonment, of the practice of penality in 19th century society. We want to begin looking for this source, and we want to find it uh, now, presumably, elsewhere than in uh, prisons in the thought on the, the in the thought of penality uh, and, uh, and uh, in reflections of penality and so forth well one of the places we've already begun to find such a uh, such a place uh, one of them is this image which I really hesitate to call a metaphor I don't know whether that's really the word for it uh, I think that it does itself um, ultimately it looks like an image so, so it looks as though uh, we said, uh, Foucault, we're doing something like this. Let's see, now, let's see imprisonment, and now as I use this, I'll use it strictly in this 19th century sense. Let's see this as part of some larger process of organizing the world, uh, which uh, we can call by the name of this. So, which we can give a picture of, presumably, or which we can give a metaphorical account of. This is halfway between an abstract idea. In a little bit, I hope we'll look at an alternative of this, which is called rationalization. That's, a, that's an abstract word. There we say uh, what's going on in, in modern society at every level uh, is a process. This process has a concept, and that concept has a, a name, an abstract word, uh, and we'll call it rationalization. Now, one can't say the quadrillage I still don't know how to say this in English. If anybody has some thoughts, uh, 
uh, uh, we, one can't say the quadrillage is a um, is a is a is an abstraction of that kind. On the other hand, I think if we pushed this far enough, we would find that behind it lay a, a type of social practice. That is to say, this is not really an image. This is not a metaphor. It is a process. It is a kind of praxis. It is the praxis of measuring. And you remember that um, Husserl, but not only Husserl, found the origins of, of geometry, first of all, in, um, in land surveying. Um, another kind of Kafka uh, circle or, or, uh, or uh, um, buckle on this, uh, on, on this whole process. Uh, ge geometry is, is uh, the abstraction of, uh, of a practice or a praxis uh, a, uh, a discipline, a, a type of work on the world uh, with its own laws, uh, which is that of surveying uh, and of measuring uh, and of quantifying, which is then uh, divested of its content as a practice and becomes a type of abstract thought. And this is then the birth of science and also for Husserl, and we'll look at that also later on, not today. Uh, also, the, the process, the, the, the point at which science risks losing its contact with its origins and becoming denatured and, um, uh, and somehow uh, um, uh, undermined. Well, it seems to me, and in Husserl, this, uh, this process whereby uh, a concept can lose its original content the content is still there, but it settles down. It's sedimented down, Husserl says. This is a process of sedimentation. The content, geometry, is still some, somewhere within it. Uh, uh, it still has the, the, uh, the, the traces of the gestuality and the praxis of land surveying. But that's been forgotten. Uh, no one who, uh, who thinks geometrically or who works with, uh, with the geometrical problems has to remember that anymore. Uh, we might say in another language, that of Freud, that the original praxis of which geometry was the theory has been repressed. That is, it's there, but it's not there. Uh, it's, not, it's not in the uh, abstraction anymore. It's not visible there, but it's still some, somewhere distant, distantly at work within it. Well, it seems to me that probably this process of quadrillage uh, also is something of that kind, whether surveying, measuring, maybe it's geometry and then surveying or something. That is that what Foucault is describing here is a good deal more, I think, but I think the, the, the actual references are to, um, well, to, to the, to the, probably to the geometry of the, of the period, I guess, and to ways, that, uh, uh, to, to ways that space was organized and people made maps and, and things of that kind. But nonetheless, you can see that, that uh, this idea has a, lot, a good deal more uh, buried and repressed or sedimented content than it would seem if we simply took it as an image and we said modern world, the modern world is, looks like that, is organized like that. Rather, we're saying, the modern world is, uh, uh, the pr is, is something produced. And what characterizes this, the style of this production is this. And this is not an image, it's a practice. So uh, we come to the notion that uh, we must, to, to begin to construct the text of uh, whatever it is that has given rise to imprisonment, uh, we, we must construct the text of something that I called a while ago programmation or of a kind of practice or uh, we must begin with something like a, um, a, a practice. Now, uh, Foucault will suddenly, and you've probably guessed this from the, um, from the um, pictures that I showed you the other day and I'll show you again, that is this kind of enigmatic sequence where we have indeed uh, justice here, but then we have uh, military discipline, uh, exercises, parades, and so on. We have lots, lots, and lots of buildings, many of them prisons, but not all. We have writing, penmanship, uh, and we have uh, the schoolroom. And finally, uh, more buildings. Uh, we finally have um, uh, 
this sort of combines it all because it's a uh, it's a con it's a lecture in the prison of, at Fresnes. It's a lecture to convicts on uh, the dangers of alcoholism, and all of these convicts are enclosed in their little um, in their little cell boxes there, and each one looking out of his own individual individual uh, receptacle. So this is an image both of pedagogy, reform, uh, um, pr imprisonment, and everything else. And finally, we conclude on this moral image of the tree, which is to be straightened. Now, uh, already, uh, as, as we said the other day, this is a very paradoxical opening for a book which is about a very vital and shocking and passionate subject, namely uh, prisons and punishment and things of that kind. But uh, it suggests, it will suggest uh, the, the, the strategy that Foucault is going to use, the passage to the generalized notion of discipline, but not to an abstract idea, rather to an area. And that area is the army. Foucault says, if you want to understand ultimately where imprisonment comes from, you have to go back to the origins of military discipline. Uh, and you have to go back then to everything that's included in that, uh, which is to say all of the techniques uh, of soldiering, uh, of parades, of exercises, uh, and so forth, uh, and the very, um, uh, the very art of this uh, nascent, um, uh, this, this nascent uh, practice which doesn't exist as such before. That is, the medieval army, one supposes, doesn't really have parades and, and uh, does not stand at attention and is not inspected, and we'll see later on that uh, the fact of the look uh, and of the measuring gaze, the gaze which is uh, which checks you to see if your if your uniform is in order and so forth, if you're standing properly and so and so on. If if the lines are straight, uh, if if everything is done uh, in a properly measured manner, the gaze is part and parcel of this whole uh, of of this whole process and is created by it and a part of it just as much uh, as it is uh, as, uh, as it is its source. Uh, well, none of this, uh, one presumes, uh, existed in the, uh, uh, in the medieval army, and I don't know about uh, classical times, but one doesn't suppose that the hoplites uh, of Athens uh, or even Sparta uh, had to organize themselves in exactly this way. This is presumably uh, a, uh, a, a, um, a product of the same kind of Baroque uh, absolutism, which uh, which is responsible for Foucault's classical episteme in uh, in the order of things, uh, and which has uh, really, uh, as I said a little while ago, um, made a given us uh, given us a problem in periodization. Insofar as on the one hand we tend to think, well, the bourgeois order is a break with this Baroque absolutism and its forms. And on the other hand, we tend to wonder, reading this book, whether indeed, especially this description of armies, whether indeed uh, the, the, uh, the, the type of order characteristic of Baroque absolutism, or on the military level, for example, on the level of taxonomy and so on, is not, however, is not rather the ancestor of the modern world rather than, uh, rather than its... Um, uh, rather than its opposite. So uh, uh, this again raises this question of whether uh, this changeover is to be seen as a break, as difference, or as identity, as a break or as a form of continuity. Uh, at any rate, then, uh, this, text of, uh, this text of domination, this text of power, which ultimately will give us something like a political technology, the body, uh, begins then with, uh, by constructing an object of study, which is um, the military art. Uh, and I don't read you these things. There's a lot of interesting documentation here about, um, uh, about modes of, uh, uh, modes of uh, control and so forth. But I want to get on to the uh, relationship of this to tableaus and so on and so forth. Uh, but I want to get on to some uh, to some of its byproducts and to the next uh, to the next step because clearly, whatever else this is, uh, this is a something which is done to the body, the military art. Uh, so we have uh, not so the body is the the 
the object of it? Well, I don't know. It's the pretext of it. Uh, but it may not be the object of it insofar as this new kind of practice or praxis, pratique I'm trying to translate, uh, uh, Pierre Bourdieu's term for uh, a certain kind of social, orderly social, uh, social process, this new uh, practice which is military discipline in, in the widest sense is going to end up producing a new form of body. The body is not, uh, is not something which is, uh, we use the, the one word for, for all of these things, but the body is something which is historical too. Uh, and one can't imagine that the body of, uh, that in a, particularly as we look back at, at, the, um, uh, at the evocation, for example, again of, of the, 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 the sacrificial executions of the Ancien Regime, we saw the sacralization of certain bodies, the, 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 the way the body of the criminal is, tr is treated, one cannot imagine that that body is the same as ours, that the body was lived in the same way uh, in a period where uh, the, the physical was valorized uh, as a kind of writing, uh, as it is in our time when the body is merely uh, the object of a certain kind of control and a certain kind of, um, uh, certain kind of discipline. So the new, the, new, uh, the new military discipline will work on the body, but ultimately it will end up producing uh, a new kind of body. Uh, and at this point, um, it seems to me that something happens which is very, uh, which is very curious, and again, really causes us to rethink everything that went on in, in, uh, in the order of things. Uh, we get something new being produced. So we get a continuity that we didn't have there. We find suddenly, well, you see, in order to, in order to control the body, you have to know it, you have to study it. Uh, one, has to, uh, one has to anatomize it. So anatomy is part of this process. Abstract knowledge is always here seen as being part of a praxis. Uh, and finally, we have this. The body uh, s uh, required to be docile uh, to its, uh, in, in, uh, excuse me for these simultaneous translations, required uh, to be docile in its uh, most minute uh, uh, operations uh, resists and, and uh, betrays the type of functioning, the conditions of functioning, which are characteristic of an organism. Disciplinary power has as its correlative uh, a, a, an indiv a, a kind of individuality which is not only analytic and cellular, like this, you want to break up the body into its smallest parts, you have to be able to, uh, everything has to be able to move as though it were separated from everything else, uh, but also a natural and an organic individuality. Now, that's life and biology. Now, in the order of things, Foucault said that life and biology as a new object of study only came into being after the classical epistemy broke down in its interstices. Now we have something which looks far more like a dialectical production of a new phenomenon. It's because you want to quantify the body that suddenly you have to take into account that it is an organism and you have to invent the idea of organism and you have to invent the idea of biology in life. So suddenly these two things, far from being successive and quite uh, moments which are, which are uh, rigidly opposed to each other, are really in a, in a very, uh, in, in, in a dialectical relationship and produce each other. And life, although it would seem to contradict this uh, rigidity of the, uh, of the natural organism, uh, of the, of the uh, rigidity of the, uh, of the mil of military discipline and so forth, life is a dialectically, the concept of life is in a kind of absolute dialectical relationship to it and compensates it at the same time that it is, uh, that it is, um, uh, that it is produced by it. Now here it seems to me uh, we see a kind of relationship which is very interesting from a, from a from point of view of literary analysis. That is the way in which uh, this kind of, um, uh, the way in which two apparently antithetical um, modes of thinking uh, can really be uh, linked desperately to each other in a kind of double bind or, or dialectical closure whereby uh, a kind of, uh, I'm thinking, well, the, what, what comes into my mind is a kind of, the kind of Dickensian um, uh, fascination with uh, kind of uh, 
sadism, which is not unlike this, these disciplinary things, uh, the mechanical, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the rigid uh, control of the utilitarian classroom and so on, the, the way in which the, the eccentric characters are reduced to kinds of mechanisms that operate in a kind of mechanical way and the way that this uh, mechanization is seen as being sadistic and, and violent, uh, the way that's in Dickens somehow dialectically related to a kind of, I don't say organic sentimentalism, but a, but, but, a, but, a, but a type of thinking and feeling which is quite different to it and which is, however, clearly, just as clearly, it's, it's dialectical opposite, not a solution of it, but uh, which depends on it for, for its existence. Uh, at any rate, I think this is uh, a, a very remarkable moment in, uh, in this book of Foucault because uh, uh, for the most part, uh, before this, uh, Foucault has been very careful to uh, efface all traces of dialectical thinking that, uh, that his work might have by accident happened to uh, betray. Uh, and suddenly here we find not only that, that those are unavoidable, but that we get some very powerful um, examples of, uh, of, uh, of just such dialectical ways of thinking about um, uh, thinking about the relationship of, of phenomena uh, and, and, their, uh, and their mutual production uh, and the way in which they are unthinkable without each other and inseparable somehow and the way in which to solve them you have to destroy the opposition too. That is, one can't think in a, di in a dialectical opposition of this kind that, well then, if discipline is bad, the organism is good. The organism being the opposite of discipline, of, of mechanical discipline, will then save us from it. No, it's a double bind. And the only way to get out of that is to abandon the opposition or to transcend it. And that's, I think, what properly what dialectical thinking is, and the kind of thing that then we'll find in abundance in, uh, in Adorno and, and Horkheimer. OK, let me go a little bit more rapidly now on this, uh, in, this, um, in this sequence of things that, that happens in Foucault. Not only do we find that, um, uh, that uh, the body uh, has to be measurable and controllable and so on in order for you to have to be able to have uh, uh, military exercises in the first place but now also time must be controlled uh, and so we get uh, I don't know if you know this remarkable essay of uh, this uh, essay of E.P. Thompson on the measurement of, of time and on the very production of, uh, uh, of the, the, the replacement of Quantify, quantifying time by uh, uh, placement by temporal quantification of older kinds of qualitative time and the very coming into being of the, the watch and the way the watch is an object of, uh, of uh, control in early industrial, uh, in early industrial life. Uh, these are the kinds of things I think that Foucault uh, has in mind um, uh, and which are, uh, which are part of this, of this process. But now, uh, this is related to something else. If uh, on the one hand, uh, the, uh, the body has to be disciplined and controlled and made absolutely uh, permeable to a kind of quantifying discipline. Then not only do we have to know about it from a point of view of organism, biology, anatomy, and so on, we also have to know something about how it, uh, how it comes to be the adult body that it is, how it learns and how it unlearns and so on. So there comes into being, and all of a sudden now we have a kind of new, we glimpse a kind of new uh, ultimately determining instance in the story that Foucault is saying. It's as though he's saying, let's pretend that military discipline in this vastest sense is the very uh, ultimate driving force of history is the ultimately the, the development of this kind of uh, uh, of this kind of uh, fact or phenomenon is the basic thing that's happening in modern history if that was so if that were so what would be its preconditions well one of them would be biology and so forth and the other one would be this whole notion then of um, a new notion of learning and indeed, and here again, we rejoin things which, uh, in the order of things, look very different, the notion of genesis. Uh, now, a whole analytical pedagogy is formed, uh, uh, minute in its detail. It decomposes uh, to the, into, its very in, into its simplest elements the raw material of pedagogy. It, it makes a, uh, 
hierar a qualitative hierarchy of each um, moment of progress, that is, of mental progress from the child to the adult. Um, and um, uh, this uh, new analytic uh, ped pedagogy is precocious also in its history. It largely anticipates on the genetic analyses of the ideologues in the late 18th century um, of which uh, it comes to seem the, the, uh, the, technical, uh, the technical model. So here, all of a sudden, we have this, uh, this notion of, um, of, of origins and the, the need to think in terms of uh, origins and genesis, the need to imagine history in terms of genesis, if you want to re rearrange history. That is, uh, someone, has, who ha someone has to, one has to go back up the, the, the sequence of formative stages and undo all that in order to start out again uh, in a better way uh, and form the proper kind of soldier, the proper kind of docile body, um, uh, and so forth. So here, so here again, we have um, uh, a, a notion of, um, of, of genesis. Uh, uh, we have a kind of practice, a kind of sub-practice which is being formed. Uh, which is being formed in order to supplement and reinforce this basic practice of military discipline. And this sub-practice, pedagogy, will produce its own theory uh, of the, uh, of the uh, development of the mind uh, in the 18th century sense, uh, and its own vision of history as genesis, and we'll find that in Rousseau. Uh, and finally, it will produce its own form of time also, and this is another place that time, uh, that time comes from. Dis the disciplinary pr procedures uh, um, produce a linear time whose moments uh, are integrated uh, the, uh, 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 with each other uh, and which is directed towards a stable terminal point. Uh, in short, evolutionary time. Uh, now, you have to remember that at the same moment, I'm still quoting Foucault, administrative and economic uh, techniques of administrative and economic control uh, produced in social time, a, uh, a produced a social t time of a serial type, which was uh, directed, end directed, and cumulative. Uh, the discovery of evolution in terms of progress. The disciplinary techniques uh, make individual series appear. Uh, discovery of an inter of an evolution in terms of genesis, progress of societies, genesis of individuals. These two great discoveries, in quotation marks, uh, of the 18th century are perhaps, and this is a significant hesitation, are perhaps correlative of the new techniques of power, and, very, and more precisely of a new a way of, a of, of, of uh, administering time and making it useful by segmentary analysis, by seriation, by synthesis and totalization. A macrophysics and a microphysics of power <coughs> permitted not uh, exactly the invention of history, uh, it didn't really need to be invented by this time, but the integration of a temporal, unitary, continuous dimension uh, of, of, of time, cum which is cumulative uh, in the exercise of its, of, of its various uh, uh, procedures and uh, in the practice of its various kinds of um, uh, disciplines. Evolutionary historicity uh, in the way in which it comes into being. Uh, and it has come into being so, been so, so deeply rooted that many people believe it just even today is common sense. Uh, evolutionary uh, historicity is linked uh, to a type of, of functioning of power. Uh, just exactly as, uh, doubtless, in the, mem the commemorative history of the chronicles of genealogies of exploits, w reigns, uh, and acts, uh, had for a long time been linked to another modality of power, the older one. With the new techniques of uh, subjection, the dynamics of continuous evolutions tend to replace the dynastics of solemn events. Now there then you see coming into being um, a kind of a one practice which then, uh, of which we can write a history, how uh, military discipline comes into being, which then generates a kind of hierarchy of other practices. 
pedagogy, uh, and then later on, and I'm going to go a little faster, later on, writing and so on, uh, that's a form of control in the schools. All of pedagogy is really comes out of this. And then experiences of daily life and temporality also finally com com come out of this and are produced by it, but are themselves uh, somehow processes. Now, of course, at that point, um, you can say, well, that's all very nice, and this is it's a, it's a very exciting way to write history, and, uh, one, and part of the excitement is indeed in the totalization that it permits. That's a word which these writers, I think, wouldn't like to hear associated with themselves very much, but uh, it is certainly a totalizing uh, kind of structural history. But uh, then you could say, well, but why, why military discipline? Why not something else? After all, uh, in one of the most famous passages of Capital Marx, uh, talks about uh, when you inspect you the inspection. Uh, then we have also new modes of um, inquiry. And these will be uh, parts of a legal infrastructure. There'll be new modes of uh, inquests into things, ways in which you prepare a dossier, uh, questions that you ask, ways in which you examine students, a whole mode of getting at uh, all these amorphous things which are either facts or, or phenomena or whatever, and putting them down on paper and quantifying them and organizing them and uh, reducing them to a kind of cadillage, which is that of the, uh, of the examination, the inspection, uh, and, the, and the parade. All of this is a, is a type of production uh, of power. Now, um, I, I don't want to... Uh, I don't want to take too much time on these lengthy quotes, although it may be interesting for you to get some sense of the way the book works. But uh, this, is a, uh, this is, for Foucault, a, a dynamic process. That is, power wants more power, and this is producing more of itself. Um, how to reinforce power in such a way that far from uh, interfering with progress, far from weighing on it by its requirements and its, uh, and its, uh, its heavy handedness, well, on the contrary, it facilitates it. That is, you think, well, uh, you know, if you're going to be, in our minds, we tend to associate rigid discipline with a certain kind of rigidity with lack of adaptation, you know. I mean, rigid societies don't go anywhere and so on and so forth. Uh, what Foucault is saying is that these are not uh, alternatives, that it's very important that uh, this uh, use of um, discipline by power be a self-perpetuating thing. What intensifier of power uh, will then at the same time be a multiplier of production. How can power, by augmenting its forces, increase those of society instead of confiscating them or, uh, or uh, reining them in? Uh, now uh, he has a solution. I'm going to mention it in a minute. The panopticon of Bentham. Uh, that's this um, kind of all-purpose uh, building in which everything is visible from from, uh, from a central point, let me see if I can find it, uh, and which will be for Foucault a kind of central symbol of this. Here's the, this is one of the plans, Bentham's plans for this panopticon, which uh, was thought of as, I think, maybe as a prison, but could accommodate all kinds of, all kinds of other things in which you had to observe uh, people from a, from a central point. Um, the, uh, the solution of the panopticon to this problem is that the productive um, increase of power can only be assured if, on the one hand, there is it, the possibility of exercising it in a continuous manner in the lower reaches of society into its very finest, most uh, minute grain, and if, on the, other, uh, on, the, on the other hand, it's able to function uh, 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 on... Uh, function uh, above and beyond uh, these sudden, violent, discontinuous forms which are linked to the exercise of sovereignty, that is to say, which are the official punishments. Got to find a kind of power which is continuous. You can't just uh, turn it on at the great moments of public executions. It has to be a, a continuous sort of process. The body of the king, with its strange material and mythic presence, with the force which uh, it um, opposes to or transmits to, to, to certain individuals, 
is at the extreme other end of this new physics of power which, the, which panoptisma or the panopticon will define. Its d d domain, uh, on the, the, the domain of the body of the king, is, on, on the contrary, that whole lower region of irregular bodies, that is qualitative bodies, qualitative space, uh, with their details, their multiple movements, their heterogeneous forces, their spatial relations. Uh, these, uh, but it, it is now a question of mechanisms uh, which we now need mechanisms to analyze distributions, separations, series, combinations, and which use instruments in order to make visible, to register, to differentiate, and to compare the physics of a relational and multiple power which has its in, uh, maximal intensity not in the body of a king, that is a center, a sacred center, uh, but rather in the bodies which these relations precisely allow us to individuate. That is to say, a kind of quantified um, uh, extension. Okay, so now we will, having analyzed this power and its needs and its relationship to the look and the quantification, suddenly we come upon, I called it a symbol a minute ago, I didn't really want to call it that, on Bentham's Panopticon. We have a long section on the organization of space, but on one particular building in space. He doesn't mean, obviously, that this building was of any importance in kind of real causal history, uh, because, in fact, he takes some pains to show that really that didn't have much effect on the development of prisons. Uh, direct effect. Uh, it is a kind of um, it is a kind of uh, lateral phenomenon in this period. It, it, historically, uh, it has not. It's a kind of historical curiosity more than anything else. Uh, so, what's it doing here? I want to say that this final um, this um, arrival of our reconstructed text of daily life, our reconstructed text of this history of power of the body which began with practices and ends up in this image of space, I want to say that that's something, and I dedicate this, this uh, expression to Umberto Eco since he uses, uses the purse term uh, a lot. I want to say that it's a material interpretant. It's not a symbol. I think that's not a very good word to use anymore. But it's a material interpretant which allows us to write this history. Peirce uh, uses the word interpretant in, um, as part of the whole, uh, it's a part of the, of infinite semiosis, which I'm sure Echo will also tell us about tomorrow. That is a constant process of transcoding, which comes when you begin to explain things to, uh, to yourself or to other people. Uh, and each uh, new code into which you translate the old one is the interpretant of the old one. So there's an infinite series of interpretants. So somebody says, what's the sun? You say, it's a star. Okay, you've replaced the sun, whatever kind of character that may be in the mythology of everyday life or children's existence or something like that, with uh, something drawn from uh, astronomy uh, and a different kind of code, which then uh, is to be the interpretant of the former one. What's a star? It's uh, a gaseous body made out of uh, helium and this and that. Now we've replaced the, uh, the, um, uh, the code of the solar system with a new kind of code of the chemical elements, and that becomes the interpretant of the older one. And each interpreter, and this is infinite, uh, obviously, because we never know either, we, we don't know uh, given any one person's needs, uh, there is no universal point at which to stop. Uh, and indeed, one can go on explaining uh, uh, infinitely in that sense. Well, I want to say then that this image of the panopticon that suddenly arises, this, uh, this picture, and it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an architect's plan, uh, and it's a description of Bentham and some, some very curious quotes about his reflections on the utility of this building, and it's, a, it's a, something visual for us, uh, at least a kind of image, that this is a kind of material interpretant which allows us to crystallize and, and therefore to make a text of this thing called power, which otherwise uh, we wouldn't be able to set down on paper because we'd be either in the vaguest kind of abstractions, all we would say would be, or, or we'd be in some other system of abstractions. We'd say, well, sure, uh, it, the ones I've been using, for example, uh, which are meaningful to me, but maybe not to you, where we say, sure, quantity replaced quality. 
but that's, those are abstractions. That's, a, that's, also, that's writing this text in a different way, too. Uh, but that's not, perhaps, uh, the most effective way of making, uh, of making uh, a new um, uh, historical text, subtext, um, text of daily life uh, suddenly appear, and of giving us something about which we can now write the narrative of history, uh, which we could not really write before because all we had was a global sense that everything changed, and that all of that, Ancien Régime, was suddenly replaced by all of this. And then we had a few abstract words. We said spectacular executions and, and quality of space, a quantity of space. But now we have, uh, now we have somehow, um, uh, again, not symbols, but, but, uh, but objects which can be, if you like, the characters of this historiographical narrative. Uh, and we have a kind of very interesting process whereby we move from uh, this characterization of the quality of modern life or modern space through the various pratiques or praxis and their relationships to each other. And we end finally on a new, uh, a new building in which it all comes together and which will then be our material interpretant in this sense that now from now on when we want to explain to people about this, let's say this is the panopticon, it's quantified and everything. Uh, now we can go around, now we can uh, we can make a commentary and we can uh, walk around this small scale model and say, now look, uh, the organization of th this building organizes memory, as in Francis Yates. We have uh, uh, this building, um, the, the doors of this building suggest this, uh, the, the dome of this building suggests something else and so forth. So we have an object which can organize our discourse because by following uh, the, this object and commenting on it from all the various points of view that are possible, suddenly our historical narrative acquires, a, uh, a, a, acquires an infrastructure uh, and acquires a, an organization that it couldn't possibly have if we wanted to remain uh, in the abstract, as you're going to see uh, uh, maybe next week when I get around to trying to define rationalization in some more abstract way. There you're, you're in the concept. I mean. Uh, how many parts does the concept of rationalization have? Five, six, very, but I mean, if you, have a, if you have a building, the panopticon uh, about which to speak and which to use as the material support of your analysis, then things are much, uh, uh, are much more possible again, I think, from the point of view of, um, of writing. Uh, okay, uh, now uh, that's the point at which Foucault then, and of course there was another reason for arriving back in this material uh, interpret it because we wanted to end up in space, right? We're going to then return to prisons at that point. And at that point, Foucault will say something about 19th century imprisonment, say something about 19th century prisons, uh, and end on uh, a date because, after all, if one's writing a fictive history, you have to have a fictive beginning and ending and so on. And his date will be the, uh, the founding of the uh, prison, of the prison for, for juvenile offenders of. Uh, Maitre in 1840. But again, choosing this date is also saying, is a bravura thing too, because it says, choose another one if you like. I think I'll choose this one because I like, uh, it's also an honor Genet, I guess, and other things. I mean, it's a kind of, uh, it already shows you that it's part of the process of constructing the, the text and not, uh, and, and not a serious, uh, he's not seriously saying, another, it's not a serious assertion that uh, modern penality as we know it begins in 1840. It rather says, if you want one, if you want to have a coupure, try this one. And this is, this is a visible one to which we can give a name, which we can embody, uh, and so forth. Now, uh, I want to make a final, uh, uh, a final um, comment on this, on this, um, on this book, uh, um, or talk about one more aspect of it. It's the relationship between uh, it's the nature of this, um, uh, of what's changed, because we do come back as we describe this, these various practices and this new kind of space that's incarnated, that takes form in this new building, and which will then produce other new buildings, which are the modern prisons, and then produce the practices of imprisonment that, that fit into those buildings and go along with them, and of which the building is something like a kind of tangible material theory. Um, 
uh, we can uh, characterize this uh, as being, uh, in, uh, in another way, as being a certain, as being the production of a new type of um, relationship to difference. We had before uh, qualitative difference, the radical difference of the king, the equally radical difference of the criminal, the, 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 uh, the inequality and heterogeneity of qualitative space. Now we have um, something which the Frankfurt School begins at once to talk about, namely repetition and identity. Now uh, the whole point about abstraction is it's a substitution of things for each other. Uh, an abstraction is substituting an idea for not just one object, but a whole mess of objects which are infinitely substitutable among each other. Uh, and this process of substitution means repetition. Uh, because uh, if you've had, uh, if you've done one chemical experiment at one point, the whole point about it is that you can repeat it. If you have, if you've achieved abstraction, numerical abstraction is the best example, those processes can always be repeated and, and, uh, and obviously they are repeated because they're all the same. That is, if everything is now quantified, this means that everything is rigorously identical. So everything is repetition. At any rate, we'll come back to this in a second uh, as, as the Frankfurt School deals with it. But we see Foucault also, um, uh, also showing us uh, how uh, a new idea of, a new way of dealing with difference comes into being uh, in this new quantified world of prisons, crime, and punishment, and so on. And this will be the idea of the norm. The norm, the idea of the norm doesn't really exist in the, in the, older, in the older system of things. Because um, there is no, the king isn't the norm. The king is, is the center, and that's not a norm. See. But now, there isn't any center anymore. Uh, now everything's the same. And this sameness on the level of uh, social behavior uh, will, be, uh, will be called the norm, and it will produce its infringement. That's called delinquence, and that's now what we do with uh, what we call and the way we think about modern offenders, as opposed to these almost sacred criminals who have to be ritually drawn and quartered and, and gutted and burned and, and so forth on, 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 as a spectacle in, um, in the older societies. Uh, but at the same time, it also produces, and here's another, the other very interesting dialectical moment um, of, uh, in this book, uh, it produces, and you can't see how it would, but it's, it's, uh, it produces individuality. Okay? Because uh, and thus, in terms of the discussions that we've been having before, it produces the bourgeois subject. Uh, this, um, in a sense, the power of normalization constrains, uh, uh, constrains to homogeneity. But it also individualizes by allowing you to measure uh, distances or differences, by determining levels, by fixing specialties, and making differences useful or utilitarian by adjusting them uh, to each other. Uh, now we begin to understand that the power of the norm uh, easily works within, in the interior of a system of, of uh, formal equality, since uh, legal, juridical equality, uh, and political equality, since within uh, this uh, homogeneity, which is the rule, it introduces as a useful imperative and the result of measurement, the whole range of individual differences. So all of a sudden, we have a different way of sorting these things out. Uh, we mustn't think, we're saying quality and quantity, we mustn't think that the, the, the realm of quality was the realm of uh, the individual subject, of the individual ego in our modern sense. It, it must have been something else, it wasn't that. Uh, it's the, the subject, the ego, individuality, is itself a dialectical byproduct, waste product almost, of this uh, uh, absolute uh, uh, e equality and um, uh, identity uh, and quantification of um, uh, which which produces a norm and which organizes the new um, the new kind of space. Uh, okay, now those were uh, those were the things that I wanted to report to you about um, uh, about Foucault. Uh, I think. Um,
you will find it interesting, uh, we won't do this here, you'll find it interesting to have a look at uh, the Dialectic of Enlightenment pages 225 to 229, A Theory of Crime, uh, in which uh, Adorno and Horkheimer reflect on many of the same things, that is, the production of modern criminality, uh, the way, indeed, in which crime becomes a state in, in Nazism, uh, the, the, the relationship to the body, the difference between the, the presence of the body in this criminality, in this punishment, and earlier periods, and, and so forth. And there's a kind of historical, anecdotal connection there, since uh, the, the study of the, the, the Marxist study of the penal system on which Foucault relies a great deal was done in the Frankfurt School and published in their series originally. So these things come back to roost in some way. Um, I think perhaps we could, we could have uh, questions, thoughts. Yeah. contrast earlier between power society and the market society. I wonder if you could elaborate well, yeah, I, this ties in with what I was, what I think I um, had tried to sketch out um, a, a few weeks ago about a, for a, uh, a, as a way of uh, getting across the, the notion of modes of production and of their succession. That is, it seems to me, I would like to, I would like to, assert as a kind of hypothesis, which one would have to prove, that all historical thought uh, ultimately can be shown to work uh, in the, the to, to, to work according to the alternatives and the typology of this basic system of, 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 uh, of, of social forms, which are, I think, in which we somehow work our way back from our own society, which is that of homo economicus, of, uh, of market organization, of quantification, to its opposite, ancien regime or feudal society, which is a society not of alienation in that strict sense of the term, but of immediate personal relationship, of domination, but not alienation, and of domination, but not reification, um, uh, and which ought therefore to be called a power society as opposed to an economic society. It doesn't mean that power doesn't exist in our society, but, uh, uh, but that, uh, the, that the dominant of our society is uh, one of, uh, of um, a different kind of abstraction, money and, and the market and so forth, and, and labor power, um, uh, where the dominant of the older society, which is immediately opposed to ours in our minds, is that of, uh, of immediate direct violence, but also direct personal relations. And then I think we tend, above and beyond that, to project uh, some other dialectical opposites of those terms, which are a society which would be neither a power nor an economic society. That's tribal society, which is before uh, the existence of the center and a political power and so forth, and also before accumulation. Uh, and then we tend to project also uh, a, a version of this, if you like, at the other uh, at the other end of time, which would be a society uh, after those things had um, had ceased to exist. Now, um, that's the kind of general framework that I that I use, and that I I want to show at work, for example, in Flaubert tomorrow when we talk about what seems to be at stake in that in that vision of history. Uh, what um, uh, what I would want more to insist on right now, uh, because this is sort of the, this is part of the things that Adorno and Horkheimer are working on. What I'd want more to stress now is the way that 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 is that that isn't a model of evolutionary succession, uh, but rather that these social forms coexist and that you have levels of uh, you have survivals of power society within economic society. Uh, Stanley Aronowitz has argued, for example, that, um, that the whole um, uh, hard hat kind of uh, conservatism of the, uh, uh, of the 60s could be seen because the working class uh, which, uh, which expressed it was essentially a Central European Catholic working class could be seen as a kind of historical uh, unequal law of development where uh, you have a, a kind of enclave 
of a power or a feudal survival within a uh, within a, uh, a a very different kind of society. I would argue myself, for example, also that um, uh, that uh, sexism is a uh, is a survive is a power survival. That is that uh, that sexism, which is really a power and not a sexual phenomenon at all, uh, is also another way in which older modes of a, of a very different social form continued to coexist uh, inside of our, with our own, and, uh, and prolong their own kinds of logic uh, within it. And I think one can also see this at work in, in literary forms and, and so forth. Yes? Excuse me, I'm a little surprised by your uh, excavating Foucault from arbitrariness. Would you care to extend uh, this, your remarks about material interpreted as you might apply to panoptical? Something like Henry Adams' Dynamo and Virgin. Is he equally accept, uh, acceptable in writing history using such, uh, well, using such a thing? I, I wish you would perhaps comment on what sort of a thing he is, is using Dynamo and Virgin. Yeah, I, I think it's analogous, although that probably has a tendency much more to become a symbol of two different periods than, than to, to be the result of a. I hate to use this jargon, but a kind of text process of textual production of the kind that's going on here. But I guess the the ascent, well, and th those are two very heterogeneous kinds of symbols too. But at least the dynamo uh, is a uh, sh shares with this um, a uh, in other words, the fundamental property of this material interpret it has to be that you can that it can be realized materially and thus commented on in the way I said but that it is also frozen or arrested praxis. Because a building is also a way of using the building, you see. So a building is a kind of praxis which finally gets to be visible uh, and tangible, uh, whereas a praxis is a lot harder. I mean, you, you have to describe techniques. And I would think the dynamo was a little bit like that, or the, the, or the factory, or, or, or whatever. Uh, but we're talking about, uh, I, I, I'm deliberately, I, I'm going to talk about later, uh, not today, but later about um, the, what's at stake in, in uh, for theories of history in these, what you call arbitrary choices of things. There is no doubt that uh, it is a very strategic thing to choose uh, the representation of power rather than the representation of production as your guiding thread. Now, that clearly is going to have very serious effects on, uh, on the ultimate uh, picture of history, uh, the, the ultimate philosophy of history that emerges from Foucault's work and which I would characterize as a kind of uh, anarchism that has very close connections with Weberian theories of bureaucracy and so on. I think by the same token, it's very strategic, and this could be a kind of another modulation towards future work, it's very strategic that the Frankfurt School begins their theory of history uh, is uh, based, it's ultimately determining instance is not production, but is survival. Uh, and for therefore, for the Frankfurt School, it's rather different from Foucault, but for the Frankfurt School, uh, one, the guiding thread of, uh, of the dynamics of history up until our own time has been the attempt to overcome the fear and the terror of nature. Uh, and uh, this is done, they show, by dominating nature. And this generates a whole a dynamics of domination, uh, which then leaves its traces absolutely everywhere in Western science and in, uh, and in every part of our, of our life. But their ultimately determining instance uh, is, then, uh, and su is then survival. Uh, and that will play a very important part then later on in their theory of the ego and, and so on and so forth. But, but it's very clear that those starting points are not accidental. Uh, but but uh, have much content uh, of their own. I wasn't dealing with it quite on that level, on the ideological level, but rather on the level of writing. That is how you get a history written, and how you uh, what uh, what the requirements are, what what kinds of new techniques one has to invent to write. If this is a postmodern history, I don't know. Yeah. Was that? Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. Another, uh... Yes. Uh, I'm 
if I'm not mistaken, and I can't even say if my memory serves because I don't, it doesn't serve at all, but uh, if I'm not mistaken, this episode doesn't really serve as that which articulates the rest of the dynamics of the, of the Iliad, but on the other hand, but it's a kind of enclave of, of something very different, which is a picture of social life or something in the midst of this absolute kind of uh, slaughter that's, that's, which is taking place somehow really beyond uh, society between uh, individuals. So in that sense, the, the shield is really, uh, um, uh, is really quite separate from, from the rest of what's going on and is not used in, in this way where it is the, the very organizing center of, of, the, of, of discourse. You see what I mean? That is, uh, seems to me the shield is the, is the relief which sets off the horrors of individual combat. Uh, it's not the same, it's radically different from those things. Yeah, but this, but uh, uh, sure, and some maybe some kind of ultimate uh, theological or cos cosmological sense, but not in this text, I don't think. I mean, we're not, we don't have much of a sense of the cosmos when one one warrior slaughters another. I mean, it's not. A, I think that that's, it's not. It's not functional to that narrative, which is really a narrative of absolute, uh, absolute identities. You know, uh, uh, kind of faceless uh, um, production of one of, of the same act uh, over and over again. I don't know. I mean, uh, at any rate, I think that uh, it's it's not in uh, Homer's. There may there were certainly material interpretants for cosmology, but cosmology is a pretty different way of thinking about the world than history, and I think it would be more useful to look, I don't know, at Thucydides or something like that and, and see if, if, uh, if something analogous were present, which I think it isn't. Because uh, this, again, this comes into being uh, at, a, at a point when the object of history, the subject matter of history, is in question. Uh, you thought you knew what to write history about. It was. Uh, the succession of the monarchs, uh, now, uh, or the rise and fall of the nation states. Now it's going to be something different. Power, the body, everyday life, what are those? How can you write a history of those? I mean, and it seems to me that that's what this, is, that what this uh, technique, if you want to call it that, is addressing. Yes? Well, it's a science, really a, a non-existent historical period since it's part of the reforms that never get embodied. But uh, no doubt uh, th th there, are, there are sort of recalls or reminiscences of older systems of that kind. Uh, and it, I, don't, uh, I don't know. Uh, um, then I guess the, then the next step would, would be to ask uh, Foucault, not me really, but Foucault, well, how, uh, how the, um, the kinds of spectacular tortures of the, of, uh, the Ancien Regime, of that kind of society, emerged out of a system which does seem much more coded and sign-like of the, of the type you, you describe. And then maybe there's, because these are not, after all, these are not, even in Foucault, I think, rigidly periodified things, but there is an unequal law of development where you have similar rhythms running, running throughout. Anyway, we saw the, the other day that uh, what precedes the Renaissance has no existence in his text. I mean, uh, uh, and that's, that's not even the material of another history, but the, the, the convention of this text is that history begins in, in the 16th or 17th century. Okay, uh, tomorrow we will, sp we will talk uh, some more then about uh, the Trois Cons de Flaubert, and next time uh, we will uh, begin at once with um, Adorno and Horkheimer, Weber, rationalization, and the like. <laughs>
next time being November 17th and 18th. Uh, yeah.